I first met Carolyn during my undergrad at Munn. She taught me the principles of neurophysiology, and I still remember how exciting these new concepts were for me at the time. I couldn't really have a better teacher for this, and it inspired me to seek her advice for my bachelor's honors project, which, based on her advice, I did with John McLean at the School of Medicine. Um, this is the book that we used, going back to the third edition. Uh, I have now the new edition in my office, um, but it's really the Bible of neuroscience. I remember that Carolyn lent me her copy, um, and it's been very informative for me. So Carolyn has long specialized in the locus ceruleus noradrenergic system, and I have inherited this from her. The importance of this tiny brainstem region to brain function and dysfunction is difficult to overstate. Um, anyone who knows me nowadays will tell you that I will annoy the hell out of them talking about the locus ceruleus. They have Carolyn to blame for that. So our first real collaboration was when I was an MSc student under Carolyn studying how the locus ceruleus is important for the long-term potentiation in the rat dentate gyrus. So at the top left here I'm showing a diagram that I put together for my master's thesis um, and a cannula that's injecting glutamate into the locus ceruleus region. This mechanism was important because it rep represents a way by which neuromodulation can affect memory formation. And clinically it has implications for conditions such as anxiety disorders and post-traumatic stress disorder in which repetitive activation of the neuroadrenergic system is thought to reinforce memory for traumatic experiences which are very difficult to extinguish. So the top two figures here are from a paper I published together with Carolyn in 2010 um, showing injection sites for the locus ceruleus. So we were basically just trying to activate the region by injecting glutamate in it and seeing how it affected uh, long-term potentiation in the dentate gyrus. On the bottom right, this is our findings. Basically what we did was activate the locus ceruleus and check out how that changed this population spike that you see in the inset here. I'm showing the amplitude of that spike and as you can see in the darker squares we see that it goes up over time and stays up over time and that's what we talk about when we say long-term potentiation. However, if we don't pair with input to that region, you don't get long-term potentiation. So we've demonstrated that you need to really activate the dentate gyrus in order to get this potentiation. So that was basically one of my first articles and I'm proud to have put that out with Carolyn. So Carolyn was always supportive of me as a student, um, even in things that didn't really directly relate to what she was doing at the time. Um, I specifically expressed an interest in computational neuroscience, um, which was a bit out there at the time. So I recall her agreeing to pay for a course at the Society for Neuroscience meeting in Washington, D.C. for a software tool called Neuron, which is being shown here. This allowed biophysical modeling of single cells or networks of such cells. The idea was that I could model the potentiation effect that I just showed you in the rat paradigm. Sadly, I didn't get very far with this. I was basically bumbling around, but I did learn a lot. And I did sow the seeds for later research, including this cool simulation I did with colleagues um, a few years later. Um, this is basically a simulation of EEG and fMRI bold in the human brain. So, Carolyn was also important just to get me started on that route. So my postdoctoral, sorry, my PhD work brought me across the pond to Germany in the Netherlands well, my PhD work focused on analysis of neuroimaging data sets, so quite different than the rat paradigms I was working on with Carolyn. We looked at age-related changes, in this case in cortical thickness, so you're seeing with the yellow regions we're, we are the regions which are most strongly affected by age. Um, and this is some of the stuff that I was doing. 
During that period, though, I kept in contact with Caroline, and even went to visit her while she was on sabbatical in Bergen, Norway. Every time we meet, of course, we would have excellent conversations about science. So after my PhD, I did a postdoc back in Canada at the Neuro in Montreal, which I'm showing here. Here I focused on brain changes underlying Alzheimer's disease, and it was at this point that my interests start to return to the locus ceruleus system. So especially this study by Brack and colleagues, or Del Tridici and Brack, um, basically showed something very surprising in that pathology primarily related to Alzheimer's disease called tau hyperphosphorylation was found in people in their 20s and 30s and seemed to saturate even long before we saw changes in amyloid pathology which was thought to be the main driver of Alzheimer's disease. Also very important is that most of this early tau pathology seemed to occur in the locus ceruleus which I'm showing here in that A to C um, diagram. And only later did it proceed to hippocampus and entorhinal cortex where the first cognitive changes are found in Alzheimer's disease. So I would visit Carolyn fairly frequently when I would go home to Newfoundland at her house in Portugal Co. And my parents house was quite close by and as anyone who knows Carolyn will attest a scientific conversation with her always leaves you enthusiastic and motivated which is that rare quality of making everyone around her feel smarter just by conversing with her. So after this conversation where we talked about this BRAC paper, we both, I think, had a new motivation to investigate this link more closely. Carolyn went on and learned optogenetics from the master, developed a rat model aimed at figuring out how tau pathology in the locus ceruleus might be transferred to hippocampus and elsewhere in the early stages of Alzheimer's disease. Me, for my part, um, I've been trying to do the same sort of approaches in humans. So most recently I've been moved to the University of Nottingham as an assistant professor. And here I've been developing a few methods that I am hoping uh, allow me to look at the relationship between locus ceruleus and Alzheimer's disease in the human brain. M mainly what I've been trying to look at um, is both a combination of EEG, eye tracking, and MRI. So I'm showing some of the results of that here. On the right, we're showing in these blurry dots are the locus ceruleus in human in high field uh, MRI scans. In the red, I'm showing activation of those regions, and the blue line, or sorry, this green line where it says bold percent change basically shows activation um, of the locus ceruleus region over time in the human being. At the bottom I'm showing my own locus ceruleus superimposed on an atlas um, based on this imaging. So we're getting closer although as you can see the images are still quite blurry because it's such a tiny region. Another thing that I've been working on is trying to stimulate the locus ceruleus with a naturalistic task. So this video is showing the task that I'm using um, which is a highway driving task. And this blue circle is showing both where people are looking while they do the task and its size is the pupil size. This gives an indication, uh, because pupil is related to locus ceruleus activation, of how the locus ceruleus is activated while people are driving. So I'm really hoping to use this task um, to get closer at what's going on in human beings as they're aging and as they start to form Alzheimer's disease symptoms. Here are some of the results from this. Um, basically what we're showing is that as people make decisions on this highway task, their pupil starts to dilate transiently and then comes down again after they've finished that decision. And this is modulated by how hard the uh, task is. So we're getting somewhere with this. Most of this, though, is based on a conversation that I had in Carolyn's kitchen over supper. So my dream is to find a way to combine this human research with pioneering rat studies that Carolyn is doing with her colleagues at MUN, including Sue and Chi and others. Can we find a way to link these two systems such that we learn from the rat 
and the human together. I believe we certainly can and will. So to end off, I'd just like to say, without a doubt, nobody has inspired or motivated me in my research career more than Carolyn. I've yet to meet anyone so effortlessly, who so effortlessly breathes science and challenges me to think about how brain systems function at a fundamental level. I hope this little video has given you a taste of where this influence has led me. Thank you.